The smiling young man with the big cigar in the picture is Captain James Jabara, United States Air Force, who at 27 is a new breed of an old hero. In a fast new age of jets, like many other jet pilots in Korea, he flew propeller planes, Mustangs in fact, in World War II. His credit for five and a half enemy planes over Europe in action against Korea, he bounced Russian MiG-15s in as his F-86 Sabre for six months before he made his fifth kill and became the first jet ace in history. A career pilot since graduation from Wichita, Kansas High School in 1942, Jabara is now back in the U.S. where his wife and two children waited for him. His first person story of aerial warfare in the jet age is Captain James Jabara, United States Air Force. I had begun to think I'm never going to get that fifth MiG. I got my fourth on April 22nd of 1951, but the pickings have been pretty lean since that time. Then about 5 o'clock in the afternoon on May 20th, 1951, 14 of our F-86 Sabres from the 4th Fighter Interceptor Group were jumped by 50 commie jets over Sinaju near the Halu River. I was in the second wave of 14. I tracked on to three MiGs at 35,000 feet, picked out the last one, and bored straight in. My first two bursts ripped up his fuselage and left wing. At about 10,000 feet, the pilot bailed out, it was a good thing he did because the MiG disintegrated. Then I climbed back in to 20,000 feet to get back into the battle. I bounced six more MiGs. I closed in and got off two bursts into one of them, scoring heavily both times. He began to smoke. Then when my second burst caught him square in the middle, he burst into flames and fell into an uncontrollable spin. All I could see was a whirl fire. I had to break off them because there was another MiG on my tail. That was my bag for today. And it made me feel pretty good to know that I was the first jet ace in the history of aerial warfare. We fight a private little war up there in Meg Alley. Maybe the first time in history that two fighter outfits have engaged in such a peculiar type of warfare. On our side of the Yalu River is the 4th Fighter Interceptor Wing. On the other side are the Red MiG-15s. The capabilities and general characteristics of two airplanes are just about the same. The battle tactics of the enemy are quite similar to our own. Many advantages, which I discuss later. Here's where the puzzle comes in. We knocked down our damage several score of MiGs. Exactly how many, I honestly don't know. We've lost exactly one of our planes to enemy action and one from causes unknown. We're not magicians. We're just average fighter pilots with some previous combat time, some tactical training, and a little patience to wait for the other guy to make a mistake. But the score is lopsided, and I guess the enemy is wondering why. I'm not going to kill him, except in general terms, for this test between the best jet planes in the world is only in its first phase. The end isn't in sight yet, and the score could change, but I don't believe it will. We're in Korea for one main reason. I'm speaking of the F-86 Sabre jets. That's to shoot down as many MiGs as we can to help retain air superiority for our side and to protect are battling ground troops from the enemy air attacks. But there are a few ground rules in this private war of ours. We have to go to their ballpark, Meg Alley, in far northwestern Korea, near the Yalu River that splits North Korea, Manchuria, or the enemy won't play. That means round trips of 500 miles or more, depending on where we're based. That's a lot of difference measured in jet fuel. And we have all the normal worries, flame outs, engine failure, weather, and surprised by an enemy who knows when we're on our way through his early warning radar or CGI ground control intercepts. He has all these advantages, plus the fact that he almost never fights more than 50 miles from his base. But the biggest ground rule of all in his sanctuary in Manchuria across Yalu River, where we can run any time the fight gets too hot for comfort. Our saber is shade faster, not enough to really make a big difference. Sometimes I've Wished it had a little bit more speed. We can outdive the MiG at any altitude. The radius, our turn, is about the same, but we seem to execute it with more finesse. The MiG has a slight superiority in rate of climb and heavier firepower with its three cannon. Fortunately, they don't seem to be able to be able to hit us with it. Well, some super forts, but no fighters. Consider a fighter versus a fighter mission. We take off in four plane formations and enter the target area maybe 30 minutes later. We patrol MiG Alley, the Yalu River. The enemy initiates the bounce about 70% of the time and our tactics naturally evolve around this fact. We try to spot the MiG and anticipate his action. We drop our extra fuel tanks 
as we sight the MiG, so we can gain speed almost up to Mach 1, the speed of sound. Then we maneuver to get into firing position. After all, a fighter is simply an airborne gun platform. The pilot must turn, dive, climb to get into position to fire. At the same time, he has to watch for other planes, both his own and enemy. The fight usually starts at about 35,000 to 40,000 feet. It can wind up to 50 feet above the ground. If the MiG strike first and we're not in firing position, we break hard to the left or the right and down so we can maneuver for a better position. A wingman covers each element leader. The wingman doesn't really fire unless he has specific instructions or gets separated. It's a tough assignment as far as I'm concerned. Half my victory should go to my wingman. When I'm concentrating on my sights trying to handle the saber smoothly and follow the enemy's gyrations, I don't have time to look around and protect myself. The wingman acts as an extra set of eyes for me. He watches for MiGs and friendly planes and gives me radio warnings or signals. To me, he's worth his weight in 50 caliber ammo. If we're outnumbered or the fighting gets too rough, then we maneuver around and wait for the enemy to make a mistake. Thank God he makes more than his share of them. Like the one he made in the big scrap in April 12th of 51, I was at 25,000 feet and he was at 5,000 feet beneath me, heading for the B-29s. That advantage in altitude was my break and I used it to get speed. I caught him just as he was in range of the B-29s. The bullets saddled, stitched his fuselage. He went into loops and rows. He was badly crippled. Another burst got his engine and I saw him crash trying to leg it across Yalu. The numerical odds were against us on April 22nd when our 12 Sabres were on number 3 to 1 with Captain Norbert W. Shawick flying protection for me. I took my time about getting behind a couple of MiGs and hit them both with short bursts. I had to pop my die brakes to keep from running into one. I was still firing as he rode on his back. I followed him down but I didn't realize how close to the ground I was until he crashed. I had a hell of a time pulling out of that dive. The cockpit dial showed 9 G's before I blacked out. Fortunately, my eyes focused in about 3 seconds, and by instinct, I guess I was headed upward. That was my fourth kill. The first one was April 3rd, when Dick Becker was flying wingman. We were two against one. We saw the MiGs first at 7,000 feet, and I used 1,200 rounds, damaging the engine of one of the MiGs that flamed out and crashed about 10 miles from its home field. I damaged the other. On April 10th, we were MiG hunting. Again in the alley. We led down from 36,000 feet through the undercast and broke out into the clear at 10,000. We saw six of them at 5,000 and bounced them from the seven o'clock position. Four of the MiGs broke up into overcast and two broke down toward the ground. They just shouldn't have done it. I took after them. The leader scampered away, leaving his wingman wide open. After three lift berries, 360 degree turns, I scored hits on the wingman. I used up my 800 rounds of ammo, but Stayed with the MiG for about 30 seconds. Meanwhile, radioing my wingman, Lieutenant Otis Gordon. I started shooting. This proved necessary as the enemy pilot suddenly bailed out about 30 miles south of Sinu Ju. I was flying almost at the speed of sound, and he couldn't see much, but he had a light blue parachute, black helmet, and light gray oxygen mask. All of us would like to know who's actually flying the MiGs. It's a good bull session material, especially after a mission. The consensus is that the enemy has two teams. The first team, a lot of people think, is made up of highly trained communists and ex-Luftwaffe pilots. The second stringers are Chinese and possibly North Koreans. To me, they're all tough. The best ones are aggressive. They can maneuver the MiG, and they usually know what to do in case of trouble. What does all this add up to? To me, we come a long way and done a lot of good in the Korean Air War. Since being alerted last November, we've done our bit to keep enemy off the backs of our ground troops. I'm glad to be in combat again. I like to fly jets at high speeds, although it takes something out of a guy, even at 27. Sad news today, November 18, 1966. Colonel James Jabara, who grew up in a quiet Wichita neighborhood and later braved the fury of MiG Alley in Korea to become the world's first jet ace, died Thursday night in an automobile accident at Delray Beach, Florida. He was only 43. Florida Highway Patrol trooper said Jabara died of head injuries when a car driven by his teenage daughter, Carol, went out of control and overturned on a turnpike. She was only 16. The Wichita hero recently returned from a try at combat missions in Vietnam 
was en route from Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, where he commanded the 31st Tactical Fighter Wing to a family holiday in Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. Jabara's wife, Nina, was following in a second car and witnessed the horrible accident, Trooper said. The compact sedan in which Colonel was riding was northbound on the Sunshine State Parkway. A four-lane tow turnpike, when it swerved into the grass median, stripped from the left lane while going through a limited speed construction area. The car veered back into the highway, then went out of control, back into the median, where it rode several times and came to rest in southbound lane. Jabara, also an ace during World War II, was dead on arrival in Delray Beach Hospital. Carroll was reported in serious condition. His death came several months after jumping at a chance to fly combat missions in Vietnam. Jabara earned the title of MiG Killer and the first jet ace when he downed 15 enemy planes in Korea. Ace rating is given pilots who knock down five. He